If you look up on a clear night, somewhere dark, you'll see thousands of stars overhead. And if you're lucky, you might see some satellites or planets. Some of those stars will be near death. They've had their time, and later in this series on stellar evolution, they'll have their time in the spotlight. The majority of those stars are not unlike our sun, just further away. Our sun is currently in the longest stage of its life, the main sequence. It's existed as a cloud of interstellar dust known as a molecular cloud, and it's collapsed down until its core reached 3 million Kelvin, and it started its long road to retirement. The sun is on the main sequence, and it's not alone. Far from it. There are countless main sequence stars in our galaxy alone, but they're not all the same. My name's Thomas, you're watching Inversion Science, and this is how a star lives. Before I go on, if you missed my last video on how a star is born and would like to watch that before continuing in this video, then it's available in the top right hand corner. If not, then let's start talking about what a star actually is. The Oxford Dictionary, which is a great dictionary, don't get me wrong, doesn't have a great definition of what a star is. Their definition is that a star is a fixed luminous point in the night sky, which is a large, remote, incandescent body like the sun. This definition seems to suggest that the sun is not a star. It is. But it also suggests that stars don't move. They do. They move in both space and on the sky. And you may be wondering that surely they mean that it's fixed relative to the other stars in the sky. But again, that's not accurate. The Gaia satellite measures, among other things, the proper motion of stars, which is how much they move on the night sky. It's normally measured in arc seconds per year. The Merriam-Webster dictionary has actually got a much better definition. It defines a star as a self-luminous, gaseous, spheroidal celestial body of great mass, which produces energy by means of nuclear fusion reactions. This is a pretty accurate definition. It's self-luminous, it powers itself, it's gaseous, mostly made of hydrogen gas, spheroidal, they spin, they're not perfect spheres, neither is the Earth for that matter. And yeah, they power themselves by nuclear fusion reactions. But how? I've mentioned that the Sun is on the main sequence. Are there other types of stars? Well, yes, but that's a topic for later in this series. The topic of this video is how a star lives, how it powers itself. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion releases energy by combining two atoms together. When this happens, energy is released by converting some of the matter into energy. The idea of stars being powered by this matter to energy conversion was thought of before nuclear fusion was even theorised. In 1920, Arthur Eddington wrote a paper called The Internal Constitution of the Stars. Eddington was familiar with the work of Albert Einstein, who in 1905 had shown that matter and energy were equivalent. You know, E equals mc squared. Eddington suggested that the energy that powers the stars was this subatomic energy, and that there was sufficient in the sun to power it for 50 billion years. This idea sounds great, but how do we get the energy out? To answer this, Eddington turned to the work of British chemist and physicist Francis William Aston, who had already shown that a helium atom, which was thought to be four hydrogen atoms combined and bound together by two electrons, weighed less than the four hydrogen atoms that made it up. Eddington proposed that when a helium atom was created, this missing matter was turned into energy. This is entirely correct. While the model of the helium atom was a little flawed because they hadn't discovered the neutron yet, the idea of the missing mass being converted to energy was bang on the money. So before fusion had even been discovered, Eddington had found the mechanism which powers the stars. But how does it work? Well, fusing atoms is not easy. It takes a lot of energy to push them together, but you do get more out. The energy to fuse atoms in the sun and any other star comes from the kinetic gas energy, you know, heat. So we call it thermal nuclear fusion. Fusion in stars happens by two different methods. Which one depends on the mass of the star? The mass of a star is measured in a unit we call a solar mass, because it makes the numbers a lot easier. 
The sun is the baseline for this, and it is one solar mass, because 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms is just too big a number to even keep track of when you're dealing with numbers such as 40 solar masses, or 100 solar masses in the case of some black holes. For stars like the sun, nuclear fusion happens by a process called the proton-proton chain. The net result of this is that we start with 4 hydrogen atoms and end up with 1 helium-4 nucleus. This fusion happens through three different types of reaction. The first reaction is that two protons are combined together into something called deuterium. Deuterium is like heavy hydrogen. It's a proton, a neutron, and an electron. When they fuse together, some energy is released, and since the numbers are going to be hard to keep track of, they will be up the side of your screen. This heavy hydrogen then fuses with another proton, releasing more energy and forming an isotope of helium called helium-3, which is two protons, one neutron, and two electrons. Now the next reaction needs two of these helium-3 nuclei, so those first two reactions have to happen again, releasing more energy. These two helium-3 nuclei are then pushed together and form helium-4, two neutrons, two protons, and two electrons. Now there's two protons left over, and they're ejected along with the energy to go and do more fusion reactions. Now when you add up all of the energy released in these reactions, you land on about 26.7 mega electron volts of energy, which sounds like a lot, and it really just isn't. There are trillions and trillions of these reactions every second to power the sun. But I said before that it's only small stars, like the sun, that fuse hydrogen into helium this way. So what do bigger stars do? Well, when a star exceeds 1.3 solar masses, so that's 1.3 times the mass of the Sun, it starts to fuse hydrogen into helium by a process called the CNO cycle, where C is carbon, N is nitrogen, and O is oxygen. In this method of fusion, these heavier elements act as catalysts to the reaction to fuse the hydrogen into the helium. Now, this is a slightly more complicated way of doing it, because it takes six steps rather than three. But it's a cycle. The carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen aren't used up in this reaction. The carbon that goes in at the beginning comes out at the end. So, how does it work? The first stage is that carbon-12 fuses with another proton to give you nitrogen-13. Some energy is released in this process, and again, we'll keep track of it up the sides. Now this nitrogen-13 isn't stable, so it undergoes a process called beta-positive decay where a positively charged particle, called a positron, is released from a proton in the nitrogen-13, and you're left with a neutron. This nitrogen-13 has now become carbon-13. Now carbon-13 does what the carbon-12 did. It takes in another proton to become nitrogen-14. And nitrogen-14 is stable, so the energy is just released, and then we go on to the next stage. The nitrogen-14 then takes in another proton, becoming oxygen-15 energy again is released in this reaction. This oxygen-15 then does what the nitrogen-13 did. It undergoes beta-positive decay, emits a positron, and becomes nitrogen-15. This nitrogen-15 then takes in one final proton, the fourth one, and then splits apart. We're left with a carbon-12 like we started with, and a helium-4 nucleus, and again energy is released. But the same net process as the proton-proton chain has happened here. Four protons have gone in, and we've come out with one helium. When we add up all of these reactions, we get about the same energy out for the CNO cycle as we did for the proton-proton chain. So if we get the same energy out, then why do these two processes exist? Well, the main reason is the speed at which these reactions happen. Both of these processes convert mass into energy at a rate proportional to the temperature of the star. But these rates are very different. The proton-proton chain converts energy at a rate proportional to the temperature of the star to the power of 4, but the CNO cycle does it at a rate of the temperature to the power of 17. That's over a billion times faster. As a result, these larger stars do not live as long. We can actually calculate how long a star will spend on the main sequence by using this equation. In this equation, the 0.007 comes from the fact that only 0.7% of the mass of the hydrogen is actually converted to energy. The rest is left as helium. The x is there because the entire star isn't hydrogen. 
it's only about 73% hydrogen for a star like the Sun. The QSC is the Schoenberg Chandrasekhar limit. This is a limit to the amount of the star that can be a non-fusing core, the helium that's building up as fusion goes on. This limit is about 10% the mass of the star. M star is just the mass of the entire star, C is the speed of light, and L star is the luminosity of the star. When we plug in all the numbers, this gives us the amount of time that is spent on the main sequence for any given star, assuming you know these parameters. When we put in the statistics for the Sun, we get out a main series lifetime of about 7.7 .7 billion years. But for a much larger star, like Spica, which has a mass of 11.43 solar masses and a much brighter luminosity, 20,700 times that of the Sun, you get a main series lifetime of only about 4 million years. So these big stars, they burn bright, but they die young. How they die, though, is a topic for a future video, so make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss that video. It'll be coming soon. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, and in the comment section below, please leave any comments, questions, criticisms, or suggestions for future videos. If you'd like to do a bit more reading about this topic, the blog post with all the sources I used for this video are in the video description below. But in the meantime, I've been Thomas, you've been watching Inversion Science, and I'll see you in the next video.